Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. If you're in the room or online, man, we're just so glad that you are here. Well, Christmas season is upon us, and there's a lot of things I love, but one of the things I love about Christmas is the movies. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to give you a chance in the room. Just think about your favorite Christmas movie. Get in your head right now. And then when I say one, two, three, go, I want you all to shout it out at the same time. I'm sure I will remember every single one. You can quiz me next week. Just kidding. If you're online, just uh, type it into the chat for us, okay? So your favorite Christmas, Christmas movie, on the count of three, one, two, three, go. Yes, I heard someone yell die hard. Uh, that, that is the right answer. Uh, this wasn't an opinion. I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I heard Grinch. I heard Elf. I heard some good ones out there. And the reality is, like the video said it, and it said it well, is that most of our Christmas movies are the story of a misfit, somebody who doesn't belong, somebody who has either a bad past or something about them that is unique and challenging. And by the end of the Christmas movie, that misfit has kind of saved the day. It's no different from the first Christmas uh, or the Christmas stories we read in the Gospels. We have a sketchy family tree, a scandalous birth, a wild man running around the desert, and a baby born in a small town that is supposed to rescue the world. Well, today we're going to zero in on our family tree. So I thought it would be cool to show you a picture of me and my parents. This is from my graduation. Um, there's me. Um, that is me, I promise. Uh, that's 18-year-old Ryan. Just look at those frosted tips, right? Like if it did, you know, a child of the 90s right there, you know, somebody was watching Dawson's Creek or who knows, right? I don't know. So um, those are my parents. And we all know that we are in some shape or form. We... We are molded and shaped by our family, right? How we look, how we think, how we act. And sometimes this is very, very good, right? So one of the things that my dad was really good at is my dad was incredibly techy. I mean, we had a computer in the 80s, which was very, very rare. I was the only kid I knew who had a computer in his house. My dad was a programmer. He actually had, um, back in the day, he had a published program at Walmart. And that was all his hobby. That wasn't his job. Like, he was a very good computer guy. I remember one day, my dad said, hey, Ryan, come up. We had a computer room, so I went into the computer room, and he said, here's our email address, and he gave me email addresses, all the same one on a bunch of sheets of paper, and said, hand these to your friends so they can email us. I looked at my dad, and I said, what's email? And he goes, oh, it's going to be like the thing. Instead of sending out letters, you're going to like put it into your computer and it's going to go to your friends and stuff. And I thought, yeah, right, that'll never catch on. Um, and I went to school, gave my email address to all my friends, and every single one of them, without fail, looked at me and said, what's an email? Um, basically, what I'm trying to say today is that my dad invented the internet with Al Gore. You know, um, you're welcome. But my dad was super techie. He never really sat down and taught me any of that. But when I got into ministry, I had seven years of education and not one single class on technology. And so when I got into ministry and about half of what I did, especially in those early years, revolved around technology, I found that I could pick it up pretty quickly. And I really think a lot of that was the influence of my dad. We got some good things from our family, but we also sometimes get some negative things from our family. My family was definitely, especially my mom, was overly safety conscious. I remember when I was young, the rule was you can't go into the attic. And to me, the attic must have been like the cool place where my parents kept all the good stuff, right? And I remember like year after year asking my mom, Mom, can I go into the attic now? No, Ryan, it's too dangerous. Mom, can I go into the attic? No, Ryan, it's too dangerous. I remember one time something of mine was in the attic. I'm like, Mom, I really need to get that out of the attic. My mom said, I'll get it for you later. I said, Mom, I feel like I'm old enough to go in the attic. Please let me go in the attic. And she said, Ryan, the attic is way too unsafe. The stairs are old and rickety. They might fall and break. You'll break your neck and you'll die. And I was like, Mom, I'm 23. I had a bachelor's degree, I was in graduate school, I was engaged to be married, but the attic was way too dangerous, okay? So my, my late 50s mother opened the stairs and went up into the attic just because, you know, it was, it was too dangerous. And that, that idea of always needing to be safe and not being willing to take risk, that's something that I have to kind of continually power through and make sure I'm not living my life too safe, too in my comfort zone. Our families taught us both good things and bad, and I bet you can relate where you come from in your family really determines a lot about how you think and how you act. And the questions that I want you to think about today as we look at the scripture are these. What does your family story tell you about you? 
the good and the bad? What stories will be told about you in future generations? What are you passing on to those who come after you? And can you rewrite and change your story or your family's story if it's something you're not that proud of? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. If you don't have a Bible on you, there's some on the floor in front of you. Um, Today's scripture is on page 965 of those Bibles. And if you want to take one of those home with you because you don't have a Bible, you are more than welcome to. So I'm going to go ahead and read just the first verse of Matthew, and we'll read the last in just a minute. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So take just a minute right now and look at the rest of the chapter there. And what you will find out is that it's just a bunch of names. And I don't know about you, but for me, like, I don't get that excited by reading genealogies. Like, I just don't. To me, a genealogy, and probably to you, comes across as boring. Just out of curiosity, um, raise your hand if you've ever been reading the Bible, and you come to a genealogy, and you just skip it and move on. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Yep, sinners. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I do it too, okay? Confession is good for the soul. Because to us, genealogies are boring, right? But in the first century world, this, in the world that Matthew was writing to, and especially his Jewish audience, genealogies were exciting, and here's why. First of all, a genealogy focused is kind of a first century hype man. And what I mean by that, if I was introducing a speaker to you today, I would probably tell you about their accomplishment. I'd say today, please welcome uh, John Doe. He's, uh, he graduated from Harvard at the age of 20. Um, he started an electric generator company, and now it's the largest producers of electric generators in his spare time. He builds hospitals and orphanages in, in this country. Now, If I introduce somebody like that, you'd be like, man, get this guy up here. Like, I want to talk to him. In the first century, when introducing someone, you wouldn't use their accomplishment. You would talk about their genealogy. You would talk about their family's accomplishments because if the family was amazing, well, then this person must be amazing. The other reason why genealogies were exciting to them, especially this one in Matthew, this is politically dangerous material. And what I mean by that is in the Jewish people were waiting for a king, a Messiah. And right in that first verse we, we read, it says that this is Jesus the Messiah. You see, hundreds of years ago, the prophets had said, someday God will send a Jewish king and Messiah, and he will come and not only fix everything that's wrong with our people, defeat Rome, get them out of this oppression, but he will also make the world into a better place, that he will begin to heal all the broken things in the world. And so the Jews were excited about this person to come, but there was only one problem, is that the Jews already had a king. Rome had installed a king over Judea, and his name was Herod. Now, Herod actually had no claim to David's throne. He wasn't a descendant of David. Actually, he wasn't even fully Jewish. And so Herod would actually send his people out throughout Judea, and they would look for genealogy, genealogical records, and he would literally, especially if they were in the line of David, he would have them burned and destroyed because he didn't want anyone coming to take his throne. You see, the reason it was so important for Matthew to establish that Jesus was the, from the line of David, it was proof for Matthew and his Jewish audience that Jesus could, in fact, be the real Messiah. But the last and most important reason as to why genealogies were exciting for them is that genealogies in their day, and to some extent in ours too, they always told a story. When you read through the genealogy, some of the names you'll recognize, but some of them you won't. A first century audience, every time they came to a name they knew, it was like a hyperlink to an entire story about one of Jesus' grandparents or great-great-grandparents. In fact, if you look in Luke... Luke's genealogy is different than Matthew. And is it because the Bible contradicts itself and it's wrong? Not at all. You see, genealogies, if you've ever done one for your own family, you realize that they have to be selective. You can't possibly list every person that you've ever been related to, right? It's not possible. You have to stop somewhere. In those days, they wouldn't lie about genealogies, but what they would do is they would give you a genealogy to tell a story, the important things that they wanted you to tell. So what story was Matthew trying to tell? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, the end of the genealogy. After all the names, Matthew clues you in to the kind of story he's telling. 
Verse 17 says this, Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile to Babylon, and 14 from exile to the Messiah. You see here, David or Matthew is trying to tell a three-part story. He starts off and says there were 14 generations from Abraham to David. In the Jewish world, they would have understood that that, that was a story of blessing, of potential, of promise. Because you see, God had come to Abraham and said, from your family, I want to bless your family. But through your family, I want there someday to be a nation. And that nation is going to bless the entire earth because God is with you. From Abraham to David is a story of all these promises that God made that he would make the world a better place through this one family. Then it talks about David to exile. And that was the story of no matter how many promises and blessings God had, the Jewish people time and time again refused to obey God. And they had essentially taken the promises of God and drowned them in their own sin. Exile refers to the time when the Babylonians came, destroyed Judea and Jerusalem, exiled tons of Jewish people, left some there, but they were under the oppressive thumb of one government, one regime after another to the time of Jesus when it was the Roman Empire, they still saw themselves in exile. And the reason the genealogy is exciting, everybody knew about the story about the blessing. Everybody knew the story of, yes, our people, our families are broken and messed up. But then Matthew comes in with the genealogy and from the very first line and says, everything you have been waiting for is bursting out into the world. The hope, the joy, the love, the peace. Jesus the King is here. And I think what Matthew wants us to think about today is that the story of Jesus' family tree actually can be the story of all our families. One of the things that I think we need to see in this genealogy is that our families can be a source of blessing. And Jesus' genealogy, there's tons of heroes. I already mentioned Abraham, but think about how hard it was for Abraham. God came to Abraham and said, hey, I'm God. And Abraham says, who? Right? Like, he never heard of the one true God before. But Abraham decides to follow God, leave his land, leave his family, and put his trust in God. Fast forward, the genealogy mentions King David. David was the youngest of of all his brothers. But one day, this poor shepherd boy takes on a, a giant named Goliath, one of the enemies of the Philistines, and defeats him in combat. And long story short, David, God chooses him, even before the Goliath situation, to become king over the nation of Israel. And God's people begin to be a blessing to themselves and to others. And there's so many good things that happen in David's reign that God does through him. All of us have something in our family that we can thank God for. I grew up in a non-Christian home. Um, my fam- myself and my family came to Jesus, uh, follow Jesus later in life. But I can honestly say that God loved my family and blessed us before we even knew who he was. That theological idea of that is called oftentimes prevenient grace or common grace. It's the idea that if you're sitting here today and you don't even know if you believe in God, we still believe that God loves you, he cares about you, and that there are good things in your life that are the result of God being active in your life even if you don't know him. I already mentioned how my dad was super techie, but one of the things I loved about my dad that I I hope he's passed on to me um, is how generous he was. We never walked past a person in need. We never walked past like a Salvation Army bell ringer that you see this time of year. I never saw my dad pass up an opportunity to give. People would walk by and ask for money. And sometimes if my dad didn't have it, we would literally go to an ATM, get out money, and my dad would give it to somebody. He would be all over that Christmas Eve offering, even as a non-Christian. I even remember when I wanted to go to church, my dad told me that he, you know, he didn't believe in God. He didn't want to follow God. But anytime I needed a ride to youth group, my dad took me. Anytime I needed money for a retreat or an event for youth group, my dad always paid for it. And he never complained once about taking me to youth group. One of the things that I, I, I sort of inherited from my mom, but I honestly, I want even more of, my mom was known for being tough as nails. She had had a really rough family background and it had made her very, very tough. And she was able to weather almost any storm. I remember when I felt called to be a pastor and my mom and dad still weren't Christians at this point. And I remember telling them I wanted to go to Mount Vernon, become a pastor. It was a private Christian school. And I, I remembered like my parents telling me, we're really not sure, it's kind of expensive. Years later, I found out behind closed doors, my mom said the only time 
that she ever put her foot down with my dad in all the years that they were married was when my dad said, we can't let him go to Mount Vernon. And behind the scenes, my, my mom, who did not believe in God, was not following God, told my dad, I will work and make enough money so that Ryan can go to college. If I need to work two jobs, I will. We need to make this happen for him. It's amazing to me that my mom didn't believe in God, but she believed in me. And maybe you can relate. Even though none of our families are perfect, I wonder if there's a skill you have or a passion you have that is something that you got from your parents or something you got from your family, whether it's your birth family or the family you found, maybe a teacher, a sports coach, an adult who was a mentor in your life. In modern psychology, they usually talk a lot about what damage did you get from your parents and family of origin. But a Jewish rabbi and licensed counselor, David Nold Freeman, wrote this book called Generation to Generation, where he talks about all of us have some strengths in our family somewhere that we can draw upon, that we can use, that oftentimes our problem isn't how, how bad our family was, but that we have strength that we aren't even tapping into. We have potential we're not even thinking about. And so what I'm going to ask you, what are the things in your family that you can take time even today and thank and praise God for? Now, let's be honest, though. Some of our families, or actually none of our families are perfect. In fact, you can maybe even, maybe you're sitting there today and you think, you know what, Pastor Ryan, I'm glad your family was cool, but I cannot think of one good thing about my family. Maybe you don't even know your family, and it's really, really hard to think about one good thing. Well, I want you to know today that, man, I see you, that we get you, but more importantly, Jesus gets you. He understands what it's like. Because there's something super surprising in this genealogy. I mean, as a good hype man, you would think that Matthew would talk about all the heroes of the Bible and just leave it at that, right? Put your Abraham in there, your David in there, you know, just mention all the heroes of the Bible, and you would think he would just not mention some of the ugly parts of Jesus' family tree. Yet Matthew not only leaves in the misfits, the broken in the family tree of Jesus, he actually highlights it. So many of the things he does in this genealogy, he's basically saying, look how broken Jesus' family was. Jesus' family and our family can all be sources of pain. Let's look at some of the individual names. I already mentioned Abraham and how he trusted in God. But on several occasions you read in the Old Testament, Abraham lied And actually even slept with his wife's servant girl. Jacob cheated his brother out of his inheritance. He deceived his father-in-law. Judah got together with a prostitute only to find out that it was his daughter-in-law in disguise. No, that's not the Jerry Springer show. That is literally like in our Bibles. Rahab was a Moabite, one of the enemies of Israel. And she was a prostitute. Ruth was a foreigner and an outsider. David was a, I already mentioned he was a king. But in one story, and he, David literally breaks three out of the Ten Commandments. He sees somebody else's wife. He covets her, lusts after her. He commits adultery with her and then has her husband murdered. He broke three out of the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you remember from grade school, but that's like a 70%. That's like a C minus, right? His, David's son, Solomon, was a womanizer. He worshiped idols. He starts off good, but before the, his story ends, Solomon becomes almost just like another pagan king. His son Rehoboam was a young punk who literally split the nation in half because he essentially listens to his young frat buddies instead of the old wise men. Jesus' family also has in it Manasseh. He was a king who worshipped pagan idols and sacrificed his own son to pagan gods. Then you have Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, who was a poor carpenter. There was also Mary, who was an unwed mother. Jesus' family is full of people that were flawed, broken, misunderstood, that were pushed on the outside by society. It even has people in it that were just downright sinful people. So what is Matthew trying to tell us? I think he's trying to point out that all of our families are broken, and so is Jesus's. My family, true, I mentioned before um, the good things about my parents, but honestly, um, there were some challenging things too. Both my parents came from unstable home lives. My dad's uh, family was broken so many times. I remember one time my dad told me he couldn't remember how many different stepdads he had or how many different homes he lived in. It was really rough for him. My mom grew up in a home life that was also very unstable, and there were some really, really bad things that happened to my mom when she was a young kid. 
And my parents did so much better for me and my sister than they ever got. But man, some of those things still carried on to us. My parents were always, man, we got to keep safe. We got to keep safe. Don't take risk. Keep things, play it safe. Don't, don't go out on a limb. I also, one of the things my family struggles with is anger. Like, I know you don't see it because I'm up here preaching and, you know, I'm not like yelling at you, but like the reality is if things don't go according to my plan, sometimes uh, all of a sudden I just feel unsafe and all of a sudden I can get really angry. That's something I've had to learn to deal with. So what is God trying to tell us about our own families through this passage? Isaiah 53, 6 puts it succinctly. It says this, all of us have strayed like sheep we have left God's past to follow our own, Isaiah 53, 6. Now, I've mentioned how our families are sinful and broken and just not perfect, but the reality is our families are made up of people like me and you. We lie, we gossip, we want control, we judge, we lust, we envy. We all, many of us have addictions that we just can't kick. The bad news is that we are often far more broken than we can possibly imagine. But I think the reason Matthew included the misfits in Jesus' family tree was not to point out how bad things are, but I think the reason Matthew put all these misfits in here is I think through a genealogy, Matthew is trying to shout to us that Jesus came and redeemed his family and he can redeem yours as well. I think the message in Matthew is that yes, families are broken and awful, but yet they have so much potential. But Jesus isn't afraid of our flaws, our brokenness. He's not afraid of misfits. He's not afraid of sinful people. He's not afraid of people who've made more mistakes than they can list on a sheet of paper. You see, Jesus isn't afraid to associate with people who have sins, hangups, flaws, and addictions. Christmas is for the misfits. God does not work through people who have it all together. He works through flawed and broken and sinful people. I think most of us have thought at some point in our life, you know what, I've made too many mistakes, my life is over. I, we wish we could just start over. And although you can't go back in time and change your past, Jesus can redeem it. I know that word redeem is kind of churchy. It basically means to rescue or to change. Jesus came not only to rescue his own family, not only to rescue the Jewish people, but he came so that he could rescue us, that wherever we find our lives, Jesus can paint a new picture. When I was a kid, once in a while on PBS, I would watch um, something, uh, um, this guy right here, Bob Ross, you know, the man, the myth, the legend. And he's kind of famous for, you know, he would be painting, and even as good as he was, he would make a mistake. His brush would slip, and there would be some kind of an accident. And any time there was, Bob would say, there are no accidents, or there are no mistakes, just happy little accidents. You guys got it. And he would take that smudge on the page, and he would use it to, like, paint a beautiful tree. He would take that mistake and make it something beautiful. Now, hear me clearly today. Sin matters. Sin is anything that we do that is against God's will for our life and for other and for human flourishing. Anytime we sin, it's not a happy little accident or a mistake. It unleashes brokenness and pain and hurt into God's good world and into our lives and other people's lives. I don't probably need to convince you that our world is broken. You simply just have to turn on the news. But what Matthew is saying, Jesus stepped into his family tree so that he could paint a new picture. When you say yes to Jesus, he just doesn't take away your sins, but he will take your life, your brokenness, all the pain and hurt, and he will begin to draw something new and beautiful, more precious, more valuable than you can ever imagine. So how do we allow Jesus to redeem our families and us? The first thing we need to do in order to experience this is we need to let Jesus lead our family. Throughout Matthew there are some people who say yes to Jesus and ask him to forgive their sins and begin following him. But then there's others who just say, forget you, Jesus. But what we see is the people who follow Jesus start to experience rescue and healing from him. So what does it look like to put Jesus in charge of your family? Well, obviously, you go to church, you pray, you, you, you ask him to forgive your sins, and all those things are important. But the cool thing is, is what actually takes happen when we allow Jesus to lead our family instead of Ryan, or when you allow Jesus to lead your life and your family instead of you, something amazing happens. John 1, 12 through 13 puts it this way. 
But to all him who, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. John 1, 12 through 13. You see, when you say yes to Jesus, you become part of his family. And just like you learned mannerisms and habits from your own family, you didn't try to learn a lot of your family's habits. It just happened in the course of relationship, right? That is the same thing with Jesus. When you say yes to him, you start living and acting and becoming a part of his family. And before you know it, old patterns and habits die. The other day, I got so mad, I was about ready to like give somebody a talking to. And as soon as I started walking towards them to give them a talking to, I literally felt Jesus just check and redirect me. I was still angry and I was still mad about something stupid, but I literally just kept it to myself and didn't unleash like vitriol to the people around me. You see, when I say yes to Jesus and when you say yes to Jesus, you start to learn those new habits. It begins to change your family. It begins to change your future. Pastor Mark sent out an email this week, and if you didn't read it, that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch you up. He challenged us to each week of December. There are 24 days in December. There are 24 days in the Gospel of Luke. And so each day, December 3rd is today, read the third chapter of Luke. If you get behind or you miss, it's okay. You can catch up later, but just read that chapter for that day. I think the Wright family, we're going to try to start reading it at dinner And just read, each night at dinner, just read one chapter of the Bible. It only takes five to six, maybe seven minutes for a super long chapter. And my hope is is that by reading God's word, we begin to learn new patterns and ways of being, not only together, but ways to follow Jesus into the world. You know, there were a lot of broken pieces of my family, but long story short, both of my parents later in life made a decision to follow Jesus. And the bad parts about my mom and my dad, I saw those start to go away and the good parts became even better. The reality is Jesus continues to fix my family tree. Or is my family perfect? Absolutely not. You know, we'll have you over for dinner sometime and you'll see my family is not perfect. But every single time I experience brokenness, hurt, and pain, if I make a decision to let Jesus rescue me and my family, he does. We put him in charge of our family, but we also let him forgive and release us from our past. There's a difference between knowing you're forgiven and knowing that you're released from your past. My wife is a counselor, and one of the things that a lot of her clients struggle with is like guilt and shame and just carrying it around their whole lives. One of the tools she has in her office is this guilt brick right here. If you want your own guilt brick, we'll sell them to you for $9.95, okay? Um... (laughs) But, or ninety nine ninety five. there we go. Kids got to go to college someday, right? But she will take or tell her clients, you're carrying around a lot of guilt. Let's see what that feels like. I want you to carry this brick with you everywhere. So they put it in their work bag or their purse or just carry it on them all week. And then at the end of the week, she says, wouldn't it feel so good if you just put that brick down and left it in this office today? Let go of your guilt and shame in this office, and it's okay just to walk out a new person. And I think in the church, we only get sometimes about half of this. I think most of us know that a relationship with Christ often starts when you ask Jesus to forgive your sins. But instead of letting go of our guilt, we just say, thank you, Jesus, that someday I'll be in heaven, and then you'll take my guilt away. But in the meantime, I'm going to live with my guilt and shame because I never should have done it. I'm going to feel bad about every decision I ever made. And you don't hold your guilt and shame out for everybody to see, but you just carry it behind your back, right? Like, I could do that. And then I walk around like this, and you see that Ryan's walking funny, but you don't know why. You can't see my guilt and my shame. But the reality is what I think that Jesus wants for you today, what he wanted for his family tree, for you and your family, is for you to let go of the guilt and shame of the past. Is simply just allow Jesus to take it and don't pick it up again. For some of you, your family is more broken than you could possibly imagine. Maybe you've gone through divorce. Maybe you've gone through separation. Maybe you have siblings that aren't talking to each other. Maybe you have health issues that you never thought you would have. For all of us, we have some brokenness in our family, and a lot of us carry the guilt and shame, and we think it's our fault. Sometimes maybe it is your fault, but you don't have to carry it around. I know so many dads who have told me, you know what, I wasn't a good I wasn't a good follower of Jesus for my kids, and now none of them are following the Lord, and they carry that guilt and shame. Should you apologize to your adult children if you made mistakes? Absolutely. That can be a game changer. 
but you don't have to hold on to the guilt and shame anymore. You see, Jesus releases us from our past so that he can restore your possibilities. 2 Corinthians 5.17 puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. You can experience a life where you are released from guilt and sins and shame, whether it's your first time in church or your millionth time. But I want you to think for just a minute what your life will look like. Not only will you let Jesus be your leader, not only will you let go of shame, but if you make a decision to follow Jesus, he will begin to do something amazing with your life. When I first started studying this passage, I remember that I was kind of reading it and grouping the people in the genealogy. I was looking at them, trying to figure out who they were, and there was kind of a hero column, and then there was a misfit column, right? Like, here are the heroes, Abraham, David, and then over here are the misfits. But what I realized the more I started to read is it wasn't that there was heroes and misfits. I realized that the misfits were the heroes, in that genealogy, it mentions Rahab. She was a prostitute, but when, when she met followers of God, she decided to follow God herself. And through her, not only did she help the Israelites get to the place where God wanted them to be, but she became the great-great-grandmother of Jesus. King David was an adulterer and murderer, but he repented and chose to follow God. And even though there were consequences from his sin, the last word on his life, Scripture said he was a man after God's own heart. He became the standard by which other kings were judged. Jesus releases us from the chains of our past, and he sets us free so that we can fulfill the possibilities that he has for our life. You can't undo your past, but you can definitely be healed and set free and so here's one spiritual formation exercise that you guys can do this week. This will be in the chat um, underneath our Facebook on this page. But if you want to take a picture with your phone, we don't have a paper or something you to take today. So if you're taking notes, just write this down or take a picture with your phone. On a sheet of paper this week, I want to challenge you to answer these four questions. What blessings did God give me through my family, either your birth family or your found family? What parts of my past or my family tree are holding me back? What things from your family tree are you holding on to? What parts of guilt or shame do you need to let go of? How has Jesus rescued me and my family? And what would it look like for Jesus to redeem my family and me? Jesus redeemed his family tree, and he can redeem yours. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're sitting here, and you're not sure if you believe in Jesus. I want you to know we're so glad you're here. We want you to know at the valley you can belong before you believe that this is a place where you could ask hard questions, you can wrestle with life, you can be honest because that's really the only way to get towards transformation. But maybe you're here today and you have experienced Jesus' freedom and healing. I think we all need to realize that a lot of people haven't and they are counting on you. We have this Christmas Eve service coming up. When you walked in the room today, you should have been handed a couple of these invite cards. They're also at the exits as you leave today. But I, I want you to know that I think oftentimes we think that evangelism, that sharing with people about Jesus and inviting them to church is like walking up to them and saying, hey, I just want you to know that, you know, my name is Ryan, I'm a Christian, and I'm really perfect and good, and I just know so much. Um, you should come to me, uh, and then we should go to my church, and we should sit down together, and I can teach you to be more like me, right? Now, you like me, you don't even want to be my friend anymore, right? How much more would someone not even want to come to church with me if that was my attitude? But what if I went up to somebody and said, hey, would you like to come to my church? And they said, you don't, you, don't, you don't want me to come to your church. I'm just a misfit. I'm broken. The church would light on fire if I walked in the doors. Um, what I usually tell them is, hey, man, I'm a misfit too. Like, what if your invite looked like, hey, I'm a misfit. I come from a, a, a family that's not perfect. I'm not perfect. But this Christmas season, man, would you be willing to come to church and sit with me? A lot of times to invite people to church, we think we have to be perfect Christians. If you're a, you can't invite people to go to your workplace because they know the real you, I want you to know that our world, they just have to turn on the news and see that the church is already broken. But what if we went to the world and told them, hey, we are a bunch of misfits getting together in the hope that Jesus can continue to transform and to change us, to redeem and rescue us. Each of our series, we have a bottom line that we're teaching you, the main point for the entire series, and the one for this one is simple. When we know who God uses and who he wants to reach, 
we know our marching orders. And so I want you to take these today, and you have two for a very specific reason. I want you to hold on to one, put it on your fridge, and every time you walk by it, pray for the service, but more importantly, pray for those in your life who don't know Christ. And then take one of these, the other one, and invite somebody to come to the Christmas Eve service and sit with you as one misfit to another, knowing that you can find hope and healing in Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you so much that you love us, that you care for us. But God, I know firsthand what it's like sometimes to feel that not just my family, but maybe me more than the rest of my family is broken, a misfit, and messed up. And yet, God, I know that you use us and you shape us. And so, Lord, today, would you fix the broken things with us, continue to take out the bad, put in the good. But Lord, for my friend here today that came in with just guilt and shame from the past, would you release them, God? And Lord, for all those in our community that are counting on us to invite them to Christmas Eve, would you help us to invite them? Not because they need to become like us, but Lord, because you can forgive sins and we can become like you. And so Jesus, help us to follow you with hearts fully open. Help us to share. And would you remind us that you came to rescue your family tree and you want to rescue us as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hey guys. I'm going to in a minute dismiss you, but on your way out, okay, on your way out, if you can stack chairs seven high against the wall, if you can stick around, we need about 15 people, 25 people to do that. So if you guys would do that, that'd be awesome. Thank you for your attention to God's word today. You are uh, not being dismissed, but you're being sent. No, is that